Um, so welcome, good evening. Thank you for joining us for another virtual program brought to you by the Mattapoiset Museum. My name is Jessica DeSico Carey, and I'm a board member um, at the museum. Uh, this program is sponsored by the Bridge Street Grant through the Mass Humanities, and we're working very hard to expand our offerings and community activities. So we have a couple upcoming events that we wanted to tell you about. Um, this Friday is our last walking tour of the summer, uh, 10 a.m. at the museum if you want to join us. We have Old Time Fiddle Session uh, this Sunday, August 28th at 1.30 p.m. Um, open mic, third Friday of every month. And we have a whole bunch of Halloween activities planned. I'm not going to tell you what yet because it's we're still in the planning stages, but um, look out for those events for October. Um, and if you love what we're doing and want to support us even more, please consider becoming a member. Um, we are in the middle of our membership drive. So this is the, my, the little voice in your head saying, renew your membership. So after this, go and renew your membership. Um, and I'm also going to drop the donate link in the, in the chat. If you want to make a donation to help us um, fund future programming, we would appreciate it. And I thank you to those who have already donated. Um, so without further ado, John Horgan. Thank you, Jessica. And welcome, everybody. How are you? I will uh, up front, if a cat jumps in, it's, it's, his name is Bill, and he's trying to work me for cat treats, and I must resist. Okay, so this is my return here. I was back here in June uh, talking about the history of baseball, so it's, uh, I'm so thankful to be back here uh, to speak with you tonight. Um, I'm John Horrigan. I was the former host, writer, producer of uh, The Folklorist. I was lucky recipient of five Boston New England Emmy Awards. Um, lucky to receive 20 nominations, although I'm not too happy with the batting average, that's 250. But uh, also 12 Telly Awards, 7 Communicator Awards, and uh, New TV, where the out of Newton, Massachusetts, where the TV show was produced. Went back to back in 2015 and 2016, first place nationally for arts and entertainment with the Alliance for Community Media. And the show ran from 2011 through 2016. You can still find it on YouTube under The Folklorist. And in fact, I mentioned Ichabod Paddock in the final segment that we ever did for The Folklorist, which I didn't like, um, is on that segment. But anyways, it was a critically acclaimed show that nobody was watching. <laughs> All right, there we go. Oh, thank you to Mattapoiset Museum, the coolest museum this side of the Mississippi. Appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me back. And of course, uh, I'm going to tell you right up now, the views expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter and not uh, those of Mattapoiset Museum. Uh, the reason why I'm showing you this is because I will be describing, not in detail, cannibalism. I, so I'm, I'm kind of saying this lecture is for adults 17 years and above, but if you're less than that, we can chill together. We'll get through this. But I just want to warn you, I have to talk about cannibalism. There's no way around it. And hopefully we've all had dinner. I haven't yet. Anyways, my two sources. First of all, Nathaniel Philbrook in the Heart of the Sea. I have this on Kindle. I have the hard copy book. I have the audio book. He is a rock star in terms of historians. This guy, we're so blessed. Um, it's time to mention his name uh, at the level of David McCullough. Um, we've got like Stephanie Shoro, who's a wonderful historian. But but this guy here, I've learned so much from him. And uh, his book is the is the benchmark tome. And then, of course, Owen Chase's book, The Wreck of the Whale Ship Essex. You can find that, Owen Chase's book, the audio of it, on YouTube for free. So check that out. And, uh, of course, I use Internet sources, and including Wikipedia. Wah, wah, wah. So we're going to be looking at the history of whaling and whalers. Nantucket and then the Great Fire of 46, the Essex and its crew, the voyage, Galapagos, stove by a whale, adrift, hunger, rescue, and then Uncle John's going to take you down the rabbit hole with some facts about cannibalism and drifters. All right. So, humans have engaged in whaling since prehistoric times back to 6,000 BCE, three you know, 6, 000, 9, uh, 8, 000 years ago, they've been hunting whales. The University of Alaska Fairbanks has described evidence for whaling at least as early as 1,000 before the Common Era. 
The oldest known method of catching cetaceans, that's whales, is dolphin drive hunting, in which a number of small boats are positioned between the animal and the open sea, and then the animals are herded towards the shore in an attempt to beach them. This method is still used for smaller species such as pilot whales, beluga whales, porpoises, and narwhals. It's cruel and inhumane. And that's probably the only way I'd support Greenpeace in anything with, with that effort. Anyways, another early method used... Remember, I had that disclaimer up front. I'm responsible. Anyways, another early method used a drogue, and that's a semi-floating object such as a wooden drum or an inflated seal skin tied to an arrow or a harpoon. And once the missile had been shot into a whale's body, the buoyancy and drag from the drogue would eventually cause the whale to tire, allowing it to be approached and then killed. Now, whaling goes way back in time, but it's, it's the... I'm just trying to hide my video panel here. Uh, okay. One sec here, folks. Zoom changed its... Uh, its, it's the, anyways, uh, whaling goes back to ancient times with the Ainu, the Inuit, Native Americans, and featured here in the left-hand corner, the Basque people of the Bay of Biscay in Spain. And uh, the Bangudai, or Bangudai petroglyphs, which are circa 5500 BCE, show sperm whales, humpback whales, and North right Pacific right whales, um, North Pacific right whales, surrounded by boats. And they suggest that drogues, harpoons, and lines were being used to kill smaller whales. And I know that we are going through an epic drought in the Northern Hemisphere. You probably heard um, that with the... Uh, drying up these rivers, they're finding these famine stones. Um, I heard today that uh, the, they're they're comparing this drought in Europe to the the heat wave of 1540, um, 500 year drought. They're saying, but it's worldwide right now, uh, from China to the United States. So I'm praying for rain. I thought we got some the other day here, an inch I heard. Right, and of course. Um, I have to hide this video panel. I'm sorry. One sec here. This is just so annoying. There we go. Cetacean bones of the same period were also found in the area, reflecting the importance of whales in the diet of prehistoric coastal people. And beginning in the late colonial period, the United States grew to become the preeminent whaling nation in the world by the 1830s. American whaling's origins were in New York and New England, including Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and nearby cities. New Bedford, right? Big whaling. And we're so lucky. We have a whaling museum in Sharon. We have the, the great one in Nantucket. Um, but this was the whaling capital, and New, New Bedford as well. But whale oil was in demand chiefly for lamps to light. Um, for the first time since tapers for, for you know, thousands of years, they could work by a brighter light, uh, which was fueled by whale oil. It's a whale lamp there. So by the 18th century, whaling in Nantucket had become a highly lucrative deep sea industry with voyages extending for years at a time and traveling as far as South Pacific waters. And during the American Revolution, the British Navy targeted American whaling ships as legitimate prizes. In turn, many whalers fitted out as privateers, that's pirates, against the British. And this uh, practice was especially prevalent during the War of 1812. And the War of 1812 was a brutal war. Again, it was the time, the uh, second decade of the 19th century was a time of famine and starvation. Uh, there was bad crop yields here in 1812 to 1815, culminating in 1816 with the year without a summer, the year without wine, um, upheaval social revolution due to multiple volcanoes going off within a 12-month span, including the major eruption at Tambora. I'm drifting. Whaling recovered after the war ended, the Revolutionary War ended in 1783, and the industry began to prosper, and they used bases at Nantucket and then New Bedford. And whalers took greater economic risks in search of profit, expanding their hunting grounds. Investment and financing arrangements allowed managers of whaling ventures to share their risks by selling some equity, that's shares, but retain a substantial portion of the profit. So the smaller the number, the larger your, your share. 
Um, and what they do with the the, the, the greenhorns, the coofs they call them, that would come out, um, they'd say, how many shares do you want? Take as many as you want, a hundred. And that would mean he'd reduce his share to nothing. And a lot of these um, uh, naive young sailors, whalers, would come home broke without any money because they'd have to pay for clothing, boarding, food, etc. As a result, they had little incentive to plan their voyages to minimize risk. In fact, when they sent out the Essex, they sent it out with minimal vittles uh, in terms of uh, the food on board, provisions. So 10,000 seamen manned the ships, including more than 3,000 African-American seamen. And early whaling efforts concentrated on right whales and humpback whales, which were found near the American coast. But as these populations declined and the market for whale products grew, American whalers began hunting sperm whales. Now, the sperm whale was particularly prized for spermaceti, which was a dense, waxy substance that burns with an exceedingly bright flame that is found in the spermaceti organ, which is located forward and above the, the large skull of the sperm whale. And remember, sperm whales are very intelligent creatures. All whales are very intelligent intelligent creatures. In fact, they're very loving uh, as well. Most of us have gone on a whale watch and um, they're just they're loving creatures akin to dolphins. Anyways, hunting sperm whales required longer whaling ver uh, voyages to get out to that area and to take their fill of barrels of oil to make their, their journey profitable. Now, whale oil was essential for illuminating homes and businesses in the 19th century, the early half, the first half of the 19th century, and lubricated the machines of the, what I call the first industrial revolution. And baleen, you can see it in the photograph here, is the long keratin strips that hang from the top of whales' mouths, and it was used by manufacturers in the United States and Europe to make varied consumer goods. Now, British competition in import duties drove New England whaling ships out of the North Atlantic, that way they didn't have to deal with privateers, and into Southern oceans. And um, that would ultimately make whaling into a global economic enterprise. In the mid-19th century, and I, I would say the, the first quarter of the 19th century, uh, first third of the 19th century, was called the Golden Age of American Whaling. Now, from 1750 to 1850, whaling was the heart of Nantucket's economy. And for the first four decades of the 19th century, the town was the undisputed whaling capital of the world, with more than 70 ships that ventured on two- to three-year whaling trips to the Pacific Ocean. That's a tough life. So commercial whaling on Nantucket actually began late in the 17th century, in the late 1600s. And of course, Europeans appropriated the land from Native Americans, and the, the Wampanoag Indians were living there. Um, a fascinating story about uh, uh, the original um, fishermen that came, including John Smith and Thomas Hunt, uh, that came to uh, what would become the United States of America from 1614 to 1619. It's my theory that the great dying, the disease that they brought, um, as white European appropriators, um, they killed off the native populations. But I believe that history t tells us that uh, um, a diseased French trapper was brought ashore in 1614 or 15 in northern Maine. I believe another person was brought ashore from one of John Smith's fleet at Patuxent, we know as Plymouth, because the area of devastation there was, was, was just... Uh, compelling. It, it, it virtually killed everybody except for Tisquantum. And the Narragansett Indians, or Native Americans, saw this and they socially distanced 400 years ago. They went into the interior and survived the great dying. I'm straying. I can go on and on about that. But anyways, the English colonists arrived at the island. Nantucket, as you know, 30 miles off of Cape Cod. They arrived for the uh, English colonists to settle there in 1659, and they found more than 2,500 Wampanoag uh, Native Americans living there at the time. And the Englishmen quickly discovered that the sandy soil of the narrow island could not support their farming practices. So they had to turn to the sea, 
one of the legends is one of the ministers is standing on a high hill and says, our farms, ladies and gentlemen, are out there, as he saw the uh, spouting of whales. So, of course, the first experience with the value of whales took place on shore, as at first they simply cut up the carcasses of right whales that washed up on the beaches. And it's tragic how, how pods of whales and dolphins just wash up on beaches. We still haven't figured that out. I'm, I suspect it's underwater sonar. Whoops. But uh, that leads them to go there. But they cut off blubber and extracted the oil by boiling it in triworks that were erected just above the high tide line. And of course, in 1672, they recruited whalers from off island to teach them how to capture and kill whales that were swimming close to shore. As I mentioned, we did a segment, our final segment on the folklore was on Ichabod Paddock. So in 1690, they recruited a prolific whaling instructor from Cape Cod by the name of Ichabod Paddock. And for the first four decades of the 19th century, the town was the undisputed whaling capital of the world with more than 70 ships that ventured, as I mentioned, on two to three year trips to the Pacific. And according to tradition, in the year 1712, a gale blew on Nantucket, uh, blew a captain out to sea, where he came upon a pod, a group of sperm whales, and one had washed ashore a few years earlier, and so islanders knew how rich a prize that sperm whales were. Now, not only was the sperm whale much larger, but its oil was far more valuable than that of other species. So the captain killed the whale and towed it into port, thus marking the beginning of the industry for which Nantucket would become famous. Now, whalemen built larger vessels, and as demand grew and the supply in New England waters began to decline, they had to travel ever longer distances in pursuit of sperm whales. And in 1775, the island has a, had a fleet of 150 whalers, generally 90 to 180 ton ships that sailed as far south as the Falkland Islands off the coast of Argentina in South America. And on the eve of the American Revolution, Nantucket was the third largest town in Massachusetts Bay Colony. Only Boston and Salem were larger. Anything that entered the 13 colonies came through Boston, Salem, Nantucket, um, Gloucester. And of course, both the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 brought whaling to a virtual halt, but Nantucket businessmen were cautious Quakers. Uh, a little bit of a hypocrisy that Quakers love, but kill the whales. Now, they weathered the interruptions, and in the first half of the 19th century, the industry reaped greater profits than ever, making Nantucket one of the wealthiest communities in the country. The men that owned the, owned the ships, they made the money. On a typical day, 15 to 20 whale ships were tied up at Nantucket's four long wharves. Some were being provisioned, some were being offloaded with blubber. Now, as the mid-century mark approached, however, the island's glory days were coming to an end as ever-shifting sandbars made access to the harbor a perennial problem, and this became more serious as whaling vessels grew larger and had a bigger draft. In fact, in time, the harbor began to fill up with silt, and this coincided in the late 1840s with the California Gold Rush, which offered young men the promise, which was rarely fulfilled, of quick riches. You can see the photo on the right there. And the fire of 1846 destroyed so much of the infrastructure, warehouses, rope walks, wharves, candle factories, blacksmith shops, etc., that the industry never recovered. Just as the Portland Gale of 1898 destroyed the fishing industry at Provincetown, so did the Great Fire of 1846 destroy Nantucket as a whaling community. And of course, the discovery of kerosene, which is a derivative of petroleum, which first came in Pennsylvania in 1859, was the final blow. So they went from candles to whale oil, and then on to kerosene, and, and finally um, oil. Let's talk about the Great Nantucket Fire. It took place around 11 o'clock at night on July 13, 1846. Um, a great book, Ack in Ashes. Ack in Ashes, look it up. A fire broke out in William M. Geary's hat shop on Main Street. This is the only known photograph 
of Main Street in Nantucket taken shortly before the fire, uh, probably known as a daguerreotype. But Nantucket was a busy commercial whaling port. The docks were lined with barrels and barrels of flammable whale oil, with closely built homes and businesses lining the narrow streets, and the fire, of course, would spread quickly. There was no coherent firefighting strategy. There were 10 volunteer fire companies, but two competing volunteer fire companies began fist fighting to determine who would have the honor of putting the fire out. And approximately one third of the town burned that night, 250 buildings gone. Barrels of whale oil were stored on the wharves. When the fire reached them, they burst into flames and the burning oil flowed into the water, creating what one man described as a sea of fire. I've studied historical fires, and uh, there's a great fire that took place in St. Louis where a lot of the riverboats burned to the water line. And again, people had to jump into water, the water to get away from it. But this was a horrific fire, and the glow could be seen from Boston. So seven hours later, most of the town's commercial area lay in ashes as almost all the markets and shops, seven factories that processed whale oil, a dozen warehouses, three of the town's four wharves, and many homes were gone. And that ended Nantucket's reign as the whaling capital. In fact, do you know what town profited off of this? New Bedford. So the fire had lasting consequences, as I mentioned. It contributed to, to the demise of Nantucket as the world's capital of the whaling industry as camphine, which is a combination of turpentine and ethanol, ethanol gleaned, of course, from corn, kerosene and oil would replace whale oil as a superior fuel and, of course, a brighter flame. So Nantucket had to pivot in that regard. And the, as the island's economy declined, so did its population. And decades of hardship followed until Nantucket began to reinvent itself, as it is today, as a tourist destination. And more than 800 houses built before the Civil War still stand, and the elegant mansions that line the main streets are testament to the great wealth produced by the whaling industry. Okay, let's get to the Essex now. We talked about Nantucket. We talked about the history of whaling on with our show. So in 1819, the British whaler Siren under Frederick Coffin, that's the Nantucket name, of Nantucket, sailed to the coastal waters of Japan. She returned to London with a huge haul on April 21st, 1822, with 346 tons of whale oil. To me, this was the penultimate haul of whale oil. And in my opinion, this is just my opinion. This is when whaling peaked with that type of haul. Everybody obviously, obviously found out that there was money to be made on these long whaling voyages. So uh, talking about the Essex itself, the Essex departed Nantucket on August 12th, 1819. And uh, the year 1819 in the United States, by the way, was its first major financial crash. It was laid down, the Essex Hull was laid down in Amesbury, Massachusetts in 1799. 238 tons, 87 feet, 7 inches in length with a beam of 24 feet, a depth of 12 feet. It had four whale boats, which were 20 to 30 feet in length, plus one spare. And let's just look at the crew here. We'll go over them in depth. And just so we understand who's on board, 21. And seven of the crew, which 33% were African Americans, and 20 to 40% of all whalers, as I mentioned during this period, were, were free men, free men of color. Um, just looking at this here, we'll look at who died at sea, who deserted at Atacams in Ecuador in September of 1820. The captain was George Pollard Jr., assuming captainship. His first mate was Owen Chase. They both survived this. Second mate, Matthew Joy, was the first to die at sea. The boat steers were Thomas Chappell, survivor. Obed Hendricks, African-American, lost. Benjamin Lawrence, survivor. William Bond was the steward. He passed away at sea. Owen Coffin died at sea. Very heroic young man. Isaac Cole died at sea. Henry DeWitt was the one who deserted in Atacams in Ecuador, September 1820. Charles Ramsdell survived. Uh, Barcelona Ray died. Samuel Reed died. Isaiah Shepard died. Charles Shorter died. 
Lawrence T Lawson Thomas died, Seth Weeks survived, Joseph West died, William Wright survived, and the cabin boy who survived, only 15 years of age, Thomas Nickerson. So, by the time the, of her fateful voyage, Essex was already 20 years old, but because so many of her previous voyages had been profitable, she had gained a reputation as a lucky vessel. Again, very superstitious fishermen are. Captain George Paul Jr. and first mate Owen Chase had served together on the ship's previous trip. They had gone around the Horn into the Pacific, and they had been highly successful, and this led to their promotions. Now, in 1819, at the age of 29, George Pollard was one of the youngest men ever to command a whaling ship. Owen Chase was 23 years old, and the youngest member of the crew was cabin boy Thomas Nickerson, who was 14 when they set out. The crew, as I mentioned, was mainly white, but there were also a small group of free black men. And those who were not native to Nantucket were called coofs, and they were looked upon as a lower class of sailor. So, if we look at the Essex itself, as I mentioned, she had recently been totally refitted, but at 88 feet in length and measuring about 239 tons burthen, she was really considered to be small for a whale ship. She was equipped with four whale boats, each about 28 feet in length, and she had an additional whale boat below decks, total of five. Now, Essex departed from Nantucket, as I mentioned, August 12th, 1819, and what was expected to be roughly two and a half years out at sea to the bountiful whaling grounds off the west coast of South America. And as I mentioned, uh, the African-Americans on the trip calling them out, all of them died. We don't know um, what happened to Henry DeWitt. Some have said he died. Some said he was rescued. Some say he spent his life at Atacamish for the rest of his life. Uh, but William Bond, Samuel Reed, Richard Peterson, Lawson Thomas, Charles Shorter, and Isaiah Shepard did die at sea. Ford, could you please mute? I'm hearing people breathing here. If you could mute, that would be great. We will open up for questions at the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Four island natives that were on board were Seth Weeks, Joseph West, William Wright, and Isaac Cole. There was one Englishman named Thomas Chapel, And the ship's captain, as I said, was George Paul Jr. First mate, Owen Chase. Second mate was Matthew Joy. Obed Hendricks. Cabin boy, Thomas Nickerson. Barsley Ray, Charles Ramsdale, Benjamin Lawrence, and Owen Coffin were all also from Nantucket. Two days after her departure from Nantucket, Essex was hit by a sudden squall in the Gulf Stream. She was knocked on her beam ends and nearly sank. She lost her top gallant sail and two whaleboats were destroyed with an additional whaleboat damaged. Just two days at sea and they lost 40% you know, of their whaleboats. Bad omen. Still, they, they could not whale for that, that uh, amount of time, two and a half years, without solid whaling boats. Captain Pollard elected to continue the voyage without replacing the boats, the two boats, or repairing the damage. He, he would go um, uh, to the uh, Azores and get replacement boats, but they were inadequate. Anyways, Essex rounded Cape, and they reprovisioned there too. Essex rounded Cape Horn in January 1820 after a transit of five weeks, which was extremely slow. You know, going around uh, Cape Horn, South America, treacherous. And of course, there's talk amongst the crew of ill omens, bad signs. And their spirits were temporarily lifted, though, when Essex began the long spring and summer hunt in the warm waters of the South Pacific Ocean, traveling north along the western coast of South America up to Atacames in what was then Spanish-ruled territory of the royal audience of Quito, or Cueto, which is present-day Ecuador. And that's where DeWitt uh, uh, snuck away. So the railing, whaling grounds they would soon find were depleted. The crew was divided into three groups of six men each. They manned one of the three usable whale boats, and whenever whales were sighted, the remaining three men stayed aboard to manage the Essex, but now they were down to two. So each whale boat was led by one of three officers, Pollard, Chase, and Joy, each of whom then chose his five other crew members, and they would decide them, of course, the captain got first pick, um, who would get the, the natives from Nantucket, who had the most experience, etc. 
And in September 1820, as I mentioned, it was when uh, Henry DeWitt deserted at Atacames, so they only had 20 men as opposed to 21. And sailors fled whaling ships all the time, by the way, but this desertion had was bad news for Captain Pollard because each of the ship's whale, whaleboats required a crew of six, and he wanted to keep three more men on board to steer the Essex while they were out whaling. You know, they weren't whaling off the side of the Essex. Essex was the home base. So only two men, including Nickerson, the young boy, 14 years old, to keep the, the Essex uh, on course while a whale hunt hunt was in progress, which was not sufficient to safely handle a ship of Essex, Essex's size and type. So omens, bad omens everywhere. Now, after finding the area's population of whales exhausted, the crew encountered other whalers who told them of a vast, newly discovered hunting ground known as the Offshore Ground, which was located between 5 and 10 degrees south latitude and between 105 and 125 degrees west longitude, about 2,500 nautical miles to the south and west of their location. Now, Irony. This was an immense distance from known shores for the whalers, farther out than most of them had ever gone, and the crew had heard rumors of cannibals, which proved to be mostly false, and it's ironic foreshadowing, that populated the many islands of the South Pacific Ocean. So, to restock their food supplies for the long journey, that's when the Essex sailed for Charles Island, which was later renamed Floriana Island in the Galapagos Islands and the crew needed to fix a serious leak and initially anchored off of Hood Island, which today is known as Espanola Island, on October 8, 1820. So they're, they're, they've been out now since they left in August of 1819 for 14 months. And during a week at anchor, they captured 300 Galapagos giant tortoises to supplement the ship's food stores. Of course, these, these big boys and girls... They lived for, for 150, some uh, close to 200 years. And then they sailed for Charles Island, where on October 22nd, they took another 60 tortoises. So 360 tortoises were taken by these men for their journey. And the tortoises weighed anywhere between 100 and 800 pounds. The sailors captured them, them alive and allowed some of them to roam around the deck. The rest they put in the hold. And uh, they believed, and they were wrong, and this is cruel punishment, they believed the tortoises were capable of living for a year without eating or drinking, but in fact, they were slowly starving to death. But they considered the tortoises delicious and extremely nutritious, and they planned to butcher them at sea as they needed. Now the fire. While they were hunting on Charles Island, Helmsman Thomas Chapel decided to set a fire as a prank. Pfft. Now this is the height of the dry season, and the fire quickly burned out of control, and it surrounded the hunters and forced them to run through the flames to escape, as Chapel hid away and cackled as they ran through, and by the time the men returned to the Essex, almost the entire island was burning. Now, the crew was so upset about the fire, and Captain Pollard swore vengeance on whoever had set it. And the next day, the island was still burning as the ship sailed for the offshore grounds. And after a full day, day of sailing, the fire was still visible on the horizon. You know, parallel with that great fire on Nantucket. So, Chapel kept to himself and only later admitted that he had set the fire because he feared a certain flogging. And of course, when they returned, it was uh, many years later, Nickerson went back to Charles Island and he found a blackened wasteland. He observed, quote, neither she trees, shrubbery, nor grass have since appeared. And in fact, the devastation on an ecological standpoint, it's been suggested that the fire contributed to the near extinction of the Floriana Island tortoise and the Floriana mockingbird, which no longer inhabit the island. What can man do? So, when Essex finally reached the promised fishing grounds thousands of miles west of the coast of South America, the crew was unable to find any whales for days. That is, until 
Tension would mount amongst the officers of the Essex, especially between Pollard and Chase, first mate and captain. You took us out here for all this time, nothing. Finally, they found a whale on November 16th, 1820, four days before they're stoved, and it surfaced directly beneath Chase's boat, with the result that the boat was dashed, he said, literally in pieces. So, now... Darcy blows at 8 in the morning on November 20th, 1820. The lookout sighted spouts and the three remaining whale, whale boats set out to pursue a pod, a group of sperm whales. And on the leeward side of the Essex, Chase's whale boat harpooned a whale. This is important in my opinion. And his tail struck the boat and opened up a seam, forcing the crew to cut the harpoon line and return to Essex for repairs. Remember that scene now. So, two miles away, on the, off the windward side, Pollard and George boats each harpooned a whale and were dragged towards the horizon away from Essex in what whalers called a Nantucket sleigh ride. Remember, when you're, you're attacking a pod of whales, perhaps um, they could be considered uh, a family or at least um, traveling together, a group. They're intelligent creatures. And Chase was repairing the damaged whale boat on board the Essex when the crew sighted an abnormally large sperm whale bull, male, reportedly about 85 feet in length, acting strangely. This is an enormous whale, and I believe at Nantucket they have a schedule almost to the scale. Huge whale. Um, the, nobody had ever seen a whale this size, and it was acting very strangely. It laid motionless on the surface, facing the ship, and then suddenly it began to swim towards the vessel, picking up speed by shallow diving. Of course, this is hyperbole taken by a painter here, a whale with three eyes. And this is one of the sketches taken by one of the men on board. The whale rammed the Essex, rocking her from side to side, and then it dived under her, surfacing close on the ship's starboard side. They had never, ever heard of such aggressive behavior from a whale. As its head lay alongside the bow and the tail by the stern, it was motionless and it appeared to be stunned. So, Chase prepared to harpoon it from the deck when he realized that the whale's tail was only inches from the ship's rudder, which the whale could easily destroy if provoked by an attempt to kill it. So, fearing to leave the ship, struck thousands of miles, stuck thousands of miles out to sea with no way to steer it, Chase hesitated. And in Chase's book, he never mentions this. Okay, Now, what do you do? Do you harpoon the whale and make it angry and does it flog its tail and all of a sudden just knock out your rudder and you're literally just drifting? Um, or do you hold back, let the whale do its business, uh, get its anger out and leave it be. Tough position to be in. So the whale recovered and then swam several hundred yards forward of the ship and then it turned around and faced the ship's bow. And this is Chase's words from his book. Quote, I turned around and saw him about 100 rods, 550 yards, directly ahead of us, coming down with twice his ordinary speed of around 24 knots. I doubt it. I'm thinking maybe six to eight. That's what Philbrook estimates. And it appeared with tenfold fury and vengeance in his aspect. I'm telling you, the new Zoom controls. The surf flew in all directions about him with the continual violent thrashing of its tail. And his head was about half out of the water. And in that way he came upon us and again struck the ship. For you, you of the whale, whalers out there are pirates, I apologize for the voice. The whale crushed the bow, driving the vessel backwards, and then finally disengaged its head from the shattered timbers and swam off, never to be seen again, leaving Essex quickly going down by the bow. Chase and the remaining sailors frantically tried to add rigging to the only remaining whaleboat, while the steward, William Bond, he ended up running below to gather the captain's sea chest and whatever navigational aids he could find. 
smart. This is the guy that actually for his actions right there and then, for what he could save, kept the men alive. And I don't think any of the men would have ever gotten back to Nantucket had it not been for the, the quick thinking of William Bond. So I salute him. A sketch. It's by Chase. Back to Owen Chase and his voice. The captain's boat was the first that reached us, and he stopped about a boat's length off, but had no power to utter a single syllable. He was so completely overpowered with the spectacle before him. He was in a short time, however, enabled to address the inquiry to me. My God, Mr. Chase, what is the matter? I answered, we have been stove by a whale. The cause of the whale's aggression is not known in the heart of the sea. Philbrick's book, he speculates that it may have first struck the boat accidentally or have had its curiosity aroused by the sound of a hammer as a whaler worked to repair a damaged whale boat by nailing in a replacement board. That's how whales communicate with a clicking noise. The frequency and sound of the nailing may have sounded similar to those made by bold sperm whales uh, to communicate and echolocate. My theory, that's just mine, is that the whale they harpooned was its mate and the act was an act of rage, was an act of revenge. That's my theory of why this whale did it. Essex was attacked approximately 2,000 nautical miles west of South America on November 20th, 1820. Um, August 20, 1819, November 20, 1820. It leaves Nantucket in August of 1819, and here they are. So, they spent two days from their three whale boats, salvaging what supplies they could from the waterlogged wreck. It took a slow time to go down, and the 20 sailors prepared to set out in the three small whale boats, aware that they had wholly inadequate supplies of food and fresh water for a journey to land. The boats were rigged with makeshift masts and sails taken from Essex, and boards were added to heighten the gunwales, the size, and prevent large waves from spilling over the sides. In Pollard's chest, they actually recovered that at the site of the wreck. In Bond's quick thinking, had managed to save two sets of navigational equipment and two copies of maritime charts. Very important. These were split between Pollard's and Chase's boats, the captain and first mate, and Joy's boat, second mate, was left without any means of navigating except to keep sight of the other boats and follow them. So we can see the map here. Examining the charts, the officers deduced that the closest islands, known as the Marquesas, were more than 1,200 miles to the west, and Captain Pollard intended to make for them, but the crew led by Owen Chase, voiced their fears that the islands might be inhabited by, yes, cannibals, and they voted to sail east instead for South America. Mistake. Unable to sail against the trade winds, the boats would first need to sail south for a thousand miles before they could take advantage of the west westerly winds to turn towards South America, which then would lie another 3,000 miles to the east. What are you thinking, mates? So this is the map here. At the end, we can look at it if you'd like, and we can just see. But well, why don't we just pause right here, just quickly, just just take a look at this. Leaving Nantucket, heading south, a provision to Cape Verde Island, reprovisioning down the east coast of South America, uh, around uh, the Horn in the Cape, and going up the west coast of South America, uh, going to Ecuador, and then heading west. And that's where they're stove by a whale uh, directly due west of South America, due west of the Galapagos. So even though they knew that this route would require them to travel twice as far as the route to the Marquesas, Pollard acceded to the crew's decision. He, should have, he was a weak captain, and their boat set their course due south. He should have stayed with his instincts. and they, Maybe more lives would have been saved, and, they, and what was to come wouldn't have happened. A crisis would have been averted. So food and water were then rationed from the beginning. That's Pollard. That's the captain thinking. But most of the food had been soaked in seawater, and the men ate this food despite it increasing their thirst because it had salt in it. Now, there have been studies on starvation and thirst, but it took around two weeks to consume the contaminated food, and by this time the survivors were rinsing their mouths with seawater and drinking their own urine. 
Several of the giant tortoises captured from the Galapagos had been brought aboard the whale boats as well, but their size prevented the crew from bringing all 360 on board. And of course, these whale boats were never designed for long voyages, and all the whale boats had been roughly repaired, and leaks were a constant and serious problem during the voyage. For instance, after losing a timber or a hole or a board, the crew of one boat had to lean one side to raise the other side out of the water until another boat was able to draw close, allowing a sailor to nail a piece of wood over the hole. And storms and rough seas frequently plagued the tiny whale boats, and the men who were not occupied with steering and trimming the sails spent most of their time bailing water from the bilge. And on December 20th, 1820, a month after they were stove by the whale, and within hours of the crew beginning to die of thirst, they landed on an uninhabited Henderson Island, the small uplifted coral atoll within the modern-day British territory of the Pitcairn Islands. Now, there was some confusion here. The men incorrectly believed that they had landed on Ducey Island, a similar atoll 220 miles to the east. Had they landed on Pitcairn Island itself, 120 miles to the southwest, they might have received help because the descendants of the survivors of the HMS Bounty, who were famously mutinied in 1789, still live there. I'll talk about the, mute, the Bounty at the end of this presentation. Now, while they were at Henderson looking for fresh water, they found a freshwater spring um, spouting out of a rock that could only was only visible at low tide. So they, they drank to their heart's content, filled whatever they could, and took it back to the boat. So this spring that they found on a rock at Henderson, Henderson saved their lives. So again, the freshwater spring below the tide line, the starving men gorged themselves on endemic birds, crabs, eggs, and pepper grass. But after just one week, they had exhausted the island's food resources. Just one week, 20 men. And today, as you can see by the photograph, you've heard of the, the great garbage patch. There's three of them now in the Pacific. It's one of the world's most polluted islands in the world. Look at that. I know, uh, Wilson, I see Wilson four times, Tom Hanks there, but just imagine those ba balls were probably uh, lost off the coast of South America. Anyways, on the 26th of December, they concluded they would starve if they remained any longer because there was no more food. They had enough fresh water, so they had prepared to sail on the whaleboats. But three men, William Wright, Seth Weeks, and Thomas Chappell, the only white members of the crew that were not natives of Nantucket, they said, hey, we're going to stay behind. And uh, we're going to stay on Henderson and, and roll the dice. Good move. Because after a year after the Essex sank, Lloyd's List reported that the Surrey, a ship at Surrey, had rescued these three men and taken them to Port Jackson in Australia. So the remaining Essex crewmen, now numbering 17 in three boats, resumed the journey on December 27th, and now they were going to head towards Easter Island. Remember, within three days, they had exhausted all the crabs and birds that they had stockpiled from Henderson in preparation for the voyage, and they only had a small reserve of the bread previously salvaged, soaked in salt water, that was taken from the Essex. So now food was a problem. On January 4th, 1821, they estimated that they had drifted too far south of Easter Island to reach it, and they decided to make for Masatiera Island instead, which was 1,818 miles to the east and 419 miles to the west of South America, right there. One by one now, the men, weak, hungry, and suffering from malnutrition, began to die. Modern day. And of course... So Matthew Joy was very sick now. He'd been poor even before Essex left Nantucket, and he's dying. And as, as conditions steadily worsened, Joy asked if he could rest on Pollard's boat until his death. And on January 10th, Joy became the first crew member to die, and Nantucketer Obed Hendricks assumed the leadership of Joy's boat. The following day, Chase's whale boat, which also carried Richard Peterson, Isaac Cole, Benjamin Lawrence, and Thomas Nickerson, became separated from the others during the squall. And Peterson, who was the oldest crew member, African American, and the most religious, lost the will to live and died on January 18th. In fact, he gave up his last ration. He said, let another man have it. 
Okay, so from this point on, lectures for adults only, viewer discretion is strongly advised. I'm going to pause right now for those of you who may be squeamish so you could move away from your computer or television and seek shelter in a safe space. They're gone. Let's continue. As with Matthew Joy, he was sewn into its clothes and buried at sea, as was the custom. On February 8th, Isaac Cole died, but with food running out, the survivors kept his body, and after a discussion, the men resorted to cannibalism. They ate his liver and kidneys, but struggled to eat the sinewy flesh. They could have saved themselves several times by sailing to nearby islands, but rumors of cannibalism on those islands would eventually transform themselves into cannibals. Hendrick's boat, carrying crew members William Bond, Lawson Thomas, Charles Shorter, Isaiah Shepard, and Joseph West, exhausted its food supplies on January 14th, and Pollard generously offered to share his own boat's remaining provisions. Pollard's boat carried Samuel Reed, Owen Coffin, Barcelay Ray, and Charles Ramsdell, and they ran out of food on January 21st, 1821, and Thomas died on January 20th, and the others decided they had no choice but to keep his body for food. Jordan died on January 23rd, Shepard on January 27th, and Reed on January 28th. They were in dire straits now, and later that day the two boats separated, and Hendrick's boat was never seen again. All three men are presumed to have died at sea. A whaleboat was later washed up on Ducey Island with the skeletons of three people inside, most likely them. So, although it was suspected to be Owen Hendricks' missing boat and the remains those of Hendricks, Bond, and West, the remains have never been positively identified. And by February 1st, the food on Pollard's boat was again exhausted and the survivors' situation became dire. So the men decided to draw lots to determine who would be sacrificed for the survival of the remaining crew members. So a young man named Owen Coffin, Captain Pollard's 18-year-old first cousin, whom he had sworn to protect when they left the island, drew the black spot. Pollard allegedly offered to protect his cousin, but Coffin is said to have replied, No. I like my lot as well as any other. Lots were drawn again to determine who would be Coffin's executioner. His young friend Charles Ramsdell, they were best friends back in the island, drew the black spot. So Ramsdell shot Coffin, and Ramsdell, Pollard, and Barzillet Ray consumed the body. On February 11th, Ray also died, and for the remainder of their journey, Pollard and Ramsdell survived by gnawing on coffins and Ray's bones. And by February 15th, the three survivors of Chase's whaleboat had again run out of food, and on February 18th, 89 days after Essex sank off the coast of Chile, the British vessel Indian spotted and rescued Chase, Lawrence, and Nickerson. A miracle. Several days after the rescue, the empty whaleboat was lost in the storm while undertow behind the boat Indian. Pollard's boat, now containing only Pollard and Ramsdell, was rescued when almost within sight of the South American coast by the, ironic, the Nantucket whale ship Dauphin, 93 days after the Essex sank on February 23rd. Pollard and Ramsdell by that time were so completely dissociative that they did not even notice Dauphin alongside them, and they became terrified when they saw the rescuers. In fact, they refused to give up to the bones that they were clinging to, and on March 5th, Dauphin encountered two brothers which were sailing to Valparaiso, and they transferred the two men to her. And after a few days in Valparaiso, Chase, Lawrence, and Nickerson were transferred to the frigate USS Constellation and placed under the care of the ship's doctor, who oversaw their recovery. After officials were informed that three Essex survivors, Wright, Weeks, and Chapel, had been left behind on Ducey Island, they were actually left on Henderson Island, the authorities asked the merchant ship Surrey, which had already intended to sail across the Pacific, to look for the men, and by God, they found them. The rescue succeeded, and on March 17th, Pollard, Ramsdell were reunited with Chase, Lawrence, and Nickerson. Can you imagine that? 
And by the time the last of the eight survivors were rescued on April 5th, 1821, the corpses of seven fellow sailors had been consumed. All eight went to sea again within months of their return to Nantucket. They need the money. And Herman Melville later speculated that all would have survived had they followed Captain Pollard's recommendation and sailed on to the island of Tahiti. Pollard would return to the sea in early 1822 to captain the whale ship Two Brothers, the same ship that rescued them, and she would become wrecked uh, on the French frigate Shoals during a storm off the coast of Hawaii. Um, and this was on his first voyage after which he joined a merchant vessel which was wrecked off the Sandwich Islands, the Hawaiian Islands, shortly thereafter. So he's cursed, right? He's called a Jonah which is unlucky, and no ship owner would ever trust him to sail on a ship again, so he was forced to retire from the sea, and he subsequently became Nantucket's night watchman, you know, ringing the bell uh, to, to call the hours. 8 p.m. and all as well. Every November 20th, he would reportedly lock himself in his room and fast, not eat, in memory of the men of Essex, and he died in Nantucket on January 7th, 1870, at the age of 78. Now, first mate Owen Chase, meanwhile, returned to Nantucket on June 11, 1821, to find that he had a 14-month-old daughter that he had never met. Four months later, he had completed an account of the disaster, which was called the narrative of the most extraordinary and distressing shipwreck of the whale ship Essex. And in fact, Herman Melville would use it as one of the inspirations for his epic novel, novel in 1851, Moby Dick. In December, Chase sailed as first mate on the whaler Florida and then as captain of Winslow for each subsequent voyage until he could afford to build his own whaler, which he called the Charles Carroll. He remained at sea for 19 years, only returning home for short periods every two or three years, each time fathering a child. His first two wives died, died though, while he was at sea. And he divorced his third wife when he found that she had given birth 16 months after he had last seen her, although he subsequently brought up the child as his own. In September 1840, two months after the divorce was finalized, he married for the fourth and final time and retired from whaling. Memories of the harrowing ordeal on Essex haunted Chase, and he suffered terrible headaches and nightmares for the rest of his life. Now, later in his life, he began hiding food in his attic of his Nantucket house on Orange Street, and he was eventually institutionalized. He died in Nantucket on March 7th, 1869, age 73. And what about the cabin boy, Thomas Nickerson? Well, he became a captain in the merchant service and late in his life wrote his own account of the sinking titled The Loss of the Ship Essex, Sunk by a Whale and the Ordeal of the Crew in Open Boats. It was this boat. Uh, this book, rather, that Philbrick used uh, to craft his novel. And it was good. You got two different perspectives. Nickerson wrote his, this account 56 years, though, after the sinking in 1876, and it was lost until 1960 when the Nantucket Historical Association finally published it in 1984. He would die at age 77 in February of, 19, of 1883. Now, other crew members that survived, Thomas Chapel died of plague fever in Timor while working as a missionary. William Wright was lost in a hurricane in the West Indies. Charles Ramsdell died on Nantucket, July 8, 1866, age 62. Benjamin Lawrence died in Nantucket, March 28, 1879, died at the ripe old age of 80. And Seth Weeks died in Barnstable County, Massachusetts, September 12, 1887. He was the final survivor of Essex to die. And of course, um, uh, it was inspired by uh, Herman Melvick's classic 1851 novel, Moby Dick. It's been dramatized in television, film, and music. Uh, the 2015 film, In the Heart of the Sea, directed by Ron Howard. Uh, it's a good one. Anything done by Ron Howard's good, in my opinion. Chris Hemsworth stars as Owen Chase, Benjamin Walker as Captain Pollard. Now, Essex is not the only ship known to have been attacked by a whale. In 1807, a whale attacked and sank the ship Union. In 1835, Pussy Hall was attacked. In 1836, whales attacked Lydia and two generals, two ships. In 1850, a whale sank Pocahontas. 
On August 20th, 1851, a whale sank the ship Anne Alexander. In 1852, a whale sank Crusader. In 1855, a whale sank Waterloo. On June 15th, 1972, a pod of killer whales sank the 43-foot schooner Lucette. And on July 7th, 1999, a humpback whale sank the 73-foot, 111-year-old Merlin in Whale Bay, Baranoff Island, off the coast of Alaska. Now, the word cannibalism is derived from the island Carib people of Lesser Antilles, and they acquired a long-standing reputation as cannibals after their legends were recorded in the 16th century. And of course, it was also practiced in New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Melanesia, the Amazon Basin, the Congo, and the Maori people of New Zealand. It was practiced in ancient Egypt and in Roman Egypt during the Great Famine of 1199 to 1202. And of course, it was uncovered to have happened in recently in modern day Liberia, the Congo, and in 2012 in Papua New Guinea. And of course, in regard to cannibalism, you probably know about the Donner Party, 1846 to 1847, and Flight 571, which crashed in the Andes Mountains in 1972, depicted in the book and film Alive. Let's not leave out the serial killers. Albert Fish went on a killing spree from 1924 to 1926, and of course, Jeffrey Dahmer, who went on a 13-year killing spree from 1978 through 1991, ate their victims as well. Now, a British vessel, Nottingham Galley, shipwrecked off the coast of Maine on Boone Island on December 11, 1710. All 14 crewmen aboard the ship survived the initial wreck, but two died from their injuries. The cook, who died a few days later after the initial wreck, and a carpenter, who died two weeks later. Then another two drowned, attempting to reach the mainland on an improvised raft. So the remaining 10 crewmen struggled to stay alive through the harsh main winter conditions with no food and no fire for 24 days until they were finally rescued, even though they could see the coast of Maine. That's what it looks like today. But before they were rescued, they resorted to cannibalism, eating the carpenter after his death, which gave the incident and Boone Island a macabre notoriety. And of course, the most famous is Mutiny on the Bounty, uh, Fletcher Christian, supported by 18 of the crew, seized firearms during the night and bound up Lieutenant William Bly in his cabin. And they put him off uh, in a 23-foot boat with 18 of his loyal men. And the launch could not hold all the loyal crew members, so four were detained on bounty for their skills. They were eventually released on the island of Tahiti. And Bly and his crew first made for Tafua only a few leagues distant to obtain supplies. However, they were attacked by hostile natives, and one of their men was killed. And of course, Meduse was a French... Uh, I, I'm sorry, I skipped a slide. There's a slide coming up. Meduse was a French warship that struck the bank of Arguin. Let me just finish by. I'm sorry, guys. So, there we go. Let me finish up on Bly. So this is the map here. We'll go back to the uh, Meduse. I bump my slides. Here. This map here shows you the red route is the bounty before the mutiny. The yellow route is the bounty after the mutiny, and the green is the route of Bly and his men who were set adrift. Concluding, they fled from Tafua, and Bly didn't dare stop at the next islands to the west, which were the Fiji Islands, as he had only a pair of cutlasses, swords, for defense, and he expected once again hostile receptions. Thus, he undertook the seemingly impossible. 4,164-mile voyage to Timor, the nearest European set settlement off the coast of Australia, the northwest coast. And Bly succeeded in reaching Timor on June 14, 1789, after 47 days, and the only casualty was the uh, crew member that he had lost on Tofua. Let's just go back to the Medusa for one moment here. Okay, so the Medusa was a French warship um, that uh, struck the bank of Arguin off the coast of present-day Mauritania in the year 1816. Most of the 400 passengers on board were evacuated, with 146 men and one woman forced to take refuge on an improvised raft towed by the frigate's launches. The boat soon abandoned the raft and its passengers in the open ocean, and without any means of navigating the shore, the situation became, aboard the raft became dangerous. 
Dozens were washed into the sea by a storm. While others were drunk from wine, they rebelled and they were killed by officers. Now, while supplies ran low, several of the injured were thrown into the sea and some of the survivors resorted to what was called the custom of the sea. That is, they engaged in cannibalism. And after 13 days at sea, the raft was discovered with only 15 people still alive. And then let's see who the long-term drifters, right? The longest time which anyone has survived a drift at sea is approximately 484 days by the Japanese captain Oguri Jukichi and one of his sailors, Orokichi. You can see the map on the right there. Their cargo ship, was, which was full of soybeans, was damaged in a storm off the Japanese coast of, in October of 1813, and they drifted in the Pacific Ocean before they were rescued by the American ship an American ship off of California on March 24th, 1815. So this is a true story. It's corroborated. But they lived off the beans and distilled seawater. But by the time of their rescue, 12 of the crew members had died of scurvy. The three surviving Japanese sailors became the first people from that country to set foot on American shores as they drifted over 5,000 miles. <coughs> now here's one of my favorite. This is Louis Zamperini, World War II veteran and a 5,000-meter distance runner who ran in the 1936 Berlin Olympics in front of Hitler. Later, he went on to join the U.S. Army Air Force as a lieutenant that, that preceded the Air Force. And he was a bombardier on B-24 Liberators in the Pacific. And on a search and rescue mission, his plane experienced mechanical difficulties and it crashed into the ocean. That's the journey you took. He drifted at sea on a life raft for 47 days, over 2,000 miles with two other crewmates, and Zamperini landed on the Japanese-occupied Marshall Islands and was captured. Now, this is a must for you. If you haven't seen the movie, I wasn't a big fan of Angelina Jolie until this movie. Now I've got a place for her in my heart. She happened to live next door to Zamperini and one day uh, talked to him in his kitchen about a story. And she had found this book by Lauren Hillenbrand, another great author. Um, and she turned it into a movie. What a story. It's a story of redemption and forgiveness. When he was captured by the Japanese after drifting uh, 47 days, uh, a Japanese um, uh, war camp commandant named Bird would beat him mercilessly. They'd, they'd make the prisoners of war drink water and jump up and down their stomach. The Japanese did horrific things to prisoners of war, uh, as they did to China as well. But uh, uh, just a few years ago, before this movie was made, they arranged Bird to meet up with Zamperini. And Bird came up to the, the hotel entrance, and then he turned and walked away. But Zamperini forgave him. Anyways, um, uh, Poon Lim, um, we're at the close here, folks. Poon Lim was a Chinese sailor who survived 133 days alone in the South Atlantic. He sailed in a British merchant ship that was sunk by a German U-boat, the U-172, on November 23, 1942. He soon found an eight-foot wooden raft with supplies, and when the supplies ran low, he resorted to fishing, catching seabirds, and rain collection. That's his route there, right-hand corner. And on April 5, 1943, Poon Lim was rescued by three Brazilian fishermen as he neared the coast of Brazil after 133 days adrift at sea. That's an actual photograph. He still holds the record for the longest survival on a life raft, and he said that he truly hopes no one ever has to beat his record. Way to go, Poon Lim. And now there's some nefarious stories, and they're recent, too. And I don't believe them. I think there's drugs and there's... Anyways, January 2014, Jose Salvador Alvarenga. He was rescued by people living in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean, suffering from severe dehydration, back pain, and swollen joints. That's him right there. He claims that he had survived more than a year at sea, covering an area of 6,700 miles in a boat for 438 days by catching fish, birds, and turtles with his bare hands. That's his alleged route. Okay. His ordeal apparently began when he left Mexico for a fishing trip in December 2012. It was hit by a storm which sent him and a fellow fisherman, Ezequiel Cordoba, off course. Again, this is... One man tells the story. He said that he stayed alive by drinking urine, rainwater, and the blood of birds for 14 months. 
In 2015, however, he denied claims in a lawsuit filed by Mr. Alvarenga's family that he committed cannibalism by eating his crewmate Cordoba to stay alive. I think he did, but I don't believe they drifted that far. Tough story to believe. Uh, and then uh, Jesus Eduardo Vidana, Lucio Rendon, and Salvador Ordonez were found in the South Pacific in August of 2006 after allegedly, allegedly drifting for nine months. The three men said they set out on a shark fishing expedition from the Mexican port of, of uh, San Blas some 5,000 miles away the previous October. That's the men as soon as they were rescued. Look at their condition, okay? Right? That's as they were rescued, within an hour. They said their 27-foot boat had been caught by strong winds and dragged out to sea, where they later ran out of fuel, and they were left at the mercy of the currents, surviving on raw fish, birds, and rainwater. The trio said that two other crew members died because they were not able to stomach the diet, and their bodies were thrown into the sea. This is the picture taken uh, two days later. Pretty good shape, huh? They were eating pretty well. They denied allegations that they may have been trafficking drugs. I think you were. And that they had resorted to cannibalism. I think you did. You ate your crewmates. When asked what, why they seemed to be in such good health after such an ordeal, they replied that the tuna fishermen who had rescued them had treated them very well. And then, of course, cannibalism has been in the news lately. Has, this is the final slide here. <sighs> New York Times said that, quote, cannibalism has a time and place. Cannibalism has a time and place. Some recent books and films and shows suggest that the time is now. Can you stomach it? Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just used that paper to wrap fish in now. A taste for cannibalism, the New York Times says. A spate of recent stomach-churning books, TV shows, and films suggest we've never looked so delicious to one another. In New York Post, vegan burger hyped for tasting like human meat wins award. This is all this year. Just a couple of months ago. And here are headlines. I did a search in the New York Post because they seem to be pushing the cannibalism is okay narrative. Um, what does it say? Totally broken army hammer. I like that army hammer. Army hammer. He's an actor, was an actor. He's now, uh, he basically sexually abused his mate and told her that he literally wanted to eat chunks of flesh off fur. He's now selling timeshares in the Caymans. If you go down there and you hear his name's Army, don't buy anything. Then also, what do we have here? Mexican cartel terror schools uh, recruits in cannibalism. Next headline, French cannibal uh, escapes psych ward and attacks woman walking dog. Uh, teacher with cannibalism ten fantasies gets life in prison for Inhuman murder. Sorry, my eyes are so bad. Then, uh, what's it say? Uh, Christmas, Christmas cannibal man accused of eating um, some of this garden dust in court. Alleged cannibal uh, victims remains were. But my favorite is down below here in uh, that 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 cannibal headless body of can falls out of cannibal car after crash. But anyways, it's just a, I just can't understand why they're doing that. And then, of course, I second what Ian Mills Chonk says, stop normalizing cannibalism. And, of course, we can have fun with Monty Python, Python's mortician sketch, but at the end of the day, we are slowly drifting towards insanity. Gabriel, blow the trumpets. That's my presentation. I'm John Horgan. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for staying over time. Okay, Jessica, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask John your question. Sorry if I turn your stomachs. <laughs> I thought it was very interesting, John. <laughs> I went down the rabbit hole at the end just talking about people drifting at sea and, and, um, and, people forced to eat each other and it's just uh, it's sad it is it's very sad so so thanks everybody um i hope all is well and um from what we're hearing with food chain supply issues take them seriously trust me 
um, next year is, is I'll, I'll just say this in conclusion. I consider the lives we've lived as the before times. Um, abundance on demand, right? As human beings, what do we do? We mine, we manufacture, we pollute, we produce, we package, uh, we procure, we unpackage, we consume, we dispose, we excrete, and then we post. But what we're moving into and what I think, and I'm seeing it now in third world countries, the hunger times. Just my prediction. Peace be with you, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Thanks, John. That was great.